Uh, hi guys, in case you're wondering, no, I have not hit puberty. It's just my new voice changer. So, and for a little summary, like last time, technically, um, his mom told him like not to go up the up pipe, which is a dra- drain pipe, and then he didn't go up it, but like the, there was a pool under it, so he decided to swim in that. But then he can swim, and then somehow he got out of the little lake thingy. And, uh, yeah, then he survived, but he was upside down. And he did not know that at all. But then he realized it. So, I mean, he didn't die. So that's a good thing, I guess. So, anyways, let's continue. Chapter 6. The Lie. And, uh, and anyway, if you, like, if you forgot, like, Harry's name is, like, Okay, I'm just gonna call him Harry and Belinda Belinda, okay? Harry, Harry, where have you been? I've been really worried about you, said Belinda. Oh, I've just been, uh, you know, hunting? Uh, yes. Any luck? Now she mentioned it, Harry realized that he hadn't eaten since those 25 ants' eggs he had for breakfast. And that he was absolutely starving. He shook his head. Belinda gave him a centipedic smile, which he which she did by waving her front and feelers in a particular way. I'm glad because look what I've bought you, your favorite. And then she stepped aside and and showed him a large, crunchy, juicy treat. His favorite indeed. It was a locust, which is like a very big grasshopper. Mama, wow, thanks. Can I eat it now? Of course you can. Best in my nest, he said proudly. And he ate the locust greedily, head first, although the head was the best bit, and he usually saved it till last. And by the time he'd crunched to the last leg, he realized he wasn't feeling very happy. You can guess why, of course. He felt bad because he'd lied to his mother, but he didn't see how he could have uh, to- uh, told her he could he he had been so stupid and nearly got drowned. Still, it wasn't as if she'd absolutely forbidden him to play near the water. She'd only forbidden him to go up the up pipe to the place of the humans, and he hadn't done that. He wasn't going to do it either. Not him. No, never. He didn't want to mess with those awful humans, and he probably wouldn't have done if he hadn't. If it hadn't been for, don't even try it. Let's call him George. Well, line red banks, I just tried it. So good job in convincing me not to try it. So as she said, I'm like I could, um, so I so as she said, uh, we're just gonna call him George. Chapter seven about George. Uh, George was Harry's best friend, and they'd been best friends almost from the time they'd come out of their mother's baskets. George didn't live with his mother. He'd run off and left her, as most sentees do, as soon as he could run. And he called Harry a sissy feelers for wanting to stick with his mother. George lived and hunted alone, and because he was still very young and couldn't always catch anything, he he often felt hungry. Then he saw the sense of having a mother. He would come creeping along Belinda's nest tunnel and lie there, waving his front feelers feebly, looking really pathetic, until she would say, Oh, all right then, George, you'd better come up and have a, b- and have a bite of lizard with us. Yes, but stop teasing Harry for still living with his mama. Belinda worried a lot about Harry, he, he being such a good friends with George. Harry got to himself into enough scrapes without George leading him into all sorts of adventures. You don't have to uh, do everything George does, you know, she would often tell Harry. He's a very foolish and naughty senti. Don't worry, Mama, I can, I can think for myself, Harry would say. But it's very difficult, when your friend wants to do something that sounds exciting, to be a dry sand bed, which is like a wet blanket with us. And say you don't want to join in because your Mama wouldn't like it. So when one day George suggested that it was time to climb out onto the no-top world and do a bit of real hunting, Harry only hung back a little. He was really very keen himself to go out and see the surface world outside. Only we'll have to watch out for flying swoopers and, be- and belly wigglers and furry biters and especially humans, he said. George looked uh, taken aback, but only for a moment. Oh, I know all about those things, he said in a poo-pooing way. They're so big, uh, I don't know how I can help smelling them coming or feeling the vibrations. And we wanted to go far from the hole. Well, come on then, are you a scaredy ant or what? 
he, he said no more and followed him along a tunnel that led to the no-top world. It was night. The two young sentries poked their feelers out side by side and felt around and sniffed the outside air. It smelled wildly exciting. They couldn't see much with their weak little eye clusters, but their feeling, but their feelers told them there were lots of interesting things about. I smell food, whispered George. Me too, what is it? Harry whispered back. George crawled a little further out of the hole and waved his feelers some more. It's something lovely and meaty. Anyway, let's follow it tomorrow and find out what it is. They crawled swiftly out and ran across the ground. It was great to be outdoors. Harry wondered why his mother had never brought him here before. He could feel the fresh air along his segments and knew by his instinct he mustn't stay out long. Uh, and that that it sorry that air could make him dry out. Meanwhile, this was the best fun he'd ever had. George stopped, so suddenly Harry ran over the top of him. Smell that, George crackled quietly. The most wonderful, warm, juicy, meaty smell came to Harry's feelers. It was very close. What is it, a mouse? No, I don't know what it is. Let's go there. No, sorry, it's over there. Let's go and get it. It might be too big. It's not. Can you feel the vibrations from its feet? It's not much bigger than us. Come on, let's go for it. Get your poison pincers ready. George started to run, and Harry, who was still on his back, fell off. He added himself and ran after George. He didn't want to be left behind. They turned into a corner beside a large stone, and suddenly they saw it. In fact, they practically ran into it. It was the most fearsome looking creature they'd ever seen. It was a mole cricket. Like an, emo- like an enormous furry co- cockroach on with a pair of huge front paws like a bear's. Well, I have some bad news, Harry and George. A mole cricket is larger than you, so I mean, George, didn't any- bet any money on the fact that, like, you know, it, it wasn't any bigger than you. Because like, if uh, you did, I want my money, boy. Anyway. George reared up in uh, terror, and his top half did a swift U-turn in the air. Let's get out of here, he crackled shrilly and turned to flee. As George spun around, the thing turned as well and came lumbering after him. George was well on his way, but Harry wasn't. He was so frightened that he just stood there, and the thing came running toward him, and looking like a charging rhinoceros would to us. At the last second, Harry tried to dodge out of his pats, but the thing turned its great, ugly head and its terrible claw, uh, claw paws made a swipe at Harry. Harry instinctively, uh, Harry in- instinctively whisked his tail and uh, gave the thing a clout. That made it jump, just long enough for Harry to stick his head under it and get it, uh, and get it in a good poison bite on its belly. It went stiff. Its claw paws drooped to the ground. In another second, its thick jointed legs had collapsed under it and fell with a thud. Right on top of Harry. Chapter 9. George to the rescue! Harry's legs collapsed too, all 42 of them. His head and his first four segments were pinned under the paralyzed mole cricket. He was stunned. He lay still for a minute and then began wriggling and writhing. But I have one question. Like in the sentence, he was stunned. Who was stunned? Harry is a mole cricket because Harry because because Harry could be stunned because well you know he was squished and the mole cricket could be stunned because well he was paralyzed literally. Anyways, um, when he tried to pull backwards, he tried to lift his head and shift the weight off of him, but he couldn't. The thing was too heavy. He tried to call George. He couldn't, but he did the next best thing. He lifted his back five segments clear off the ground and waved a desperate signal with his tail feelers. George was practically back at his hole and had felt the vibrations as the thing fell. Now he looked back. He caught the signal Harry was sending with his tail feelers. He hesitated. The signal Harry was sending said, help, help, help. But the signal George was getting was more like danger, danger, danger. He wanted to keep on running. Back down the hole, to safety. But Harry was his best friend. He couldn't just leave him to the monster. He turned and raced back as fast as he could, which was very fast. As soon as he saw what had happened, he cracked loudly. Hang on, Harry. I'm here. I'll soon have you out. 
And then he ca caught uh, hold of one of the mole cricket's legs in his mouth and pulled. He twisted and turned as jer and jerked his head. The mole cricket was a dead weight. It was much heavier than anything George had ever tried to drag before. But at last, it started to shift. As soon as Harry felt it begin to move, he made a strong effort himself, and soon he got his head and front segments free. Thanks, George. Phew. If you hadn't come back, I would, I'd just have stayed uh, uh, until I started. Something got me. George rubbed his round, hard head, head segment against Harry's. You were braver than me. You bit it. It's ours now. What shall we do? Drag it home and eat it for dinner? Yes. They started to drag it and pull it with all their might. Between them, uh, between them, they got it back to a hole and then uh, went behind it and tipped it down. It started to slide down the tunnel. They ran after it and pushed and shoved some more. It slid right to the bottom. After that, they curled over it and dragged it, and it along to Belinda's nest tunnel. They arrived at last. They were tired out. Belinda was there. She didn't say anything at first. Just raised herself up and felt the mole cricket all over with her front feelers. Then she dropped down on, on to all 42 legs again. She turned right, to, right around in a tight circle several times, which is what she always did when she just didn't know what to say or do. Oh, you bad, brave, naughty, wonderful senties, she said at last. You've been up to the no-top world, haven't you? What am, what am I to do with you? Please just help us take the things fur off so we can all eat for dinner, asked Harry in a small but proud cackle. His, his mother, no, not cackle, crackle. Harry's not evil. His mother wrapped her first um, seven pair of legs around him and gave him a terrific hug. Then she hugged George, too. They had a feast. Belinda had never tasted mole cricket before. She knew what they were, all right, and told the senties that they uh, burrowed under, uh, bur under the ground, making useful tunnels and ate the roots mainly, but that they were so frightening looking that she had never dared try and attack one. She said, though, that the senties had been very foolish to go to the no-top world without her and that they weren't to do it again until they were grown up. Now, promise me. Harry was just going to promise when George said, Hey, what was that vibration? Was it a toad or just a grasshopper? Belinda rushed up to the nearest tunnel to see what it was and forgot to make them promise. If centipedes could wink, George would have winked at Harry. Chapter 11. George Wants a Thrill After the adventure with the mole cricket, George wanted to do something even more exciting. Ordinary mischief was no good at, anymore. He, he wanted another big thrill. Even if he had promised Harry's mother not to go back to the surface, I'm afraid he might not have kept it. But anyway, he hadn't, so he started making regular trips. Harry didn't go with him. What's the matter, sissy feelers? Scaredy aunt? Why won't you come? And taunted George, who didn't like having adventures by himself. I don't want to worry mama, uh, uh, muttered Harry uncomfortably. George gave a great crackle and waved his front feelers crazily in all directions. And that's, what, that's the sentie's way of laughing mockingly. Mama sentie, mama sentie, he teased. Anyway, it's silly, said Harry, when he could make himself hurt. We don't want to get hurt or killed. Last night I was chased by a hairy biter, boasted George. It jumped out of a tree and chased me, but I, I felt it hit the ground and I ran straight between its legs and up the tree and uh, into a crack where it couldn't get me. I wasn't scared, big clumsy thing. I heard it coming a mile off. Harry wasn't sure whether to believe uh, him. George was a big show off. Maybe maybe you are braver than me, he said, but I've got more sense than you anyway. Then he turned and ran down a tunnel. After a bit, George came after him. All right, all right, if you don't want to go up to the no-top world, think about something exciting to do down here. He didn't say anything. Something uh, more had ju than just exciting had popped into his head, his, he his head at once. He moved his front feelers about in a thoughtful way. George guessed that he had something interesting in his mind. What? What? He crackled, waving his legs in ripples of excitement along his sides. The up pipe, but we mustn't. What's the, what's the up pipe? It's a kind of tunnel, but we can't go up it. Mama said not to, I suppose, jeered <laughs> George. Yes, she did, because it leads to the place of humans. George stopped making ripples. Humans? What's that? I thought you said you knew about humans. George looked uncomfortable. I thought they were just another kind of hairy biter, he said. Go on then. Tell me what they are. Harry told him as well as he could. He'd never seen one himself. 
Well, you know about sometimes how we hear very big vibrations? And you know how Mama never ever goes up to see what they are? That's them. The giant two legs is as big as trees. Each one of the, uh, their feet is as big as a whole hairy biter. And they're fast. Uh, they try to get you by smashing you with their shadows. Harry must have gotten a bit of a muddle. Can you eat them? Eat them? Oh, sure, of course. A nice little snack. George looked blank. Well, could you drag a tree home, stupid? They both started laughing. And they laughed until they rolled on their backs. Then suddenly, George jerked himself right side up and said, I want to see one. They only, they only come out in the bright time, Harry said. We could stay awake and go up in the bright time. Up the up pipe? asked Harry in a shocked crackle. Are they only up the up pipe? No, Mama told me she... Mama told me she one chased her on the no top world, so we could uh, just peep at them to a hole, said George. But show me the up pipe first. No. Oh, go on. It can't hurt to look. I dare you to show it to me. Harry couldn't resist a dare, so he said, all right then. But remember, it's not the up pipe that is dangerous. It's the humans who live at the top. Looking at the up pipe. Harry led George along the forbidden tunnel to the pool. As before, there was a faint light in the earth cave. The two senti stood under the light and stared at, and stared up. The up pipe greeted George. He was impressive. Mama said the sides were slippery and hard to grip. I bet we could climb it, said George. Uh, how could we reach it? Easy, we could pile up some earth, and then if you stir and then if you saw on the pile with most of your segments upright, I could climb up to you and get a hold with my friend four or six feet. When I got a good grip, you could climb up the rest of my segments. I'll leave them hanging down for you. What would you hold on to? See that rough place near the beginning of the pipe? I'll hold that. Well, we could do it. I know we could. Oh, come on, Hooks. Uh, no, sorry. Oh, come on, Harry. Let's. But uh, Harry he shook his round little head. And, and what uh, And what? when we get to the top? What if a hu- human saw us? We turn right around and go back down. If they're as big as you said, they couldn't possibly follow us. And George at once started scuffling about with his front to eight pair of legs on his head, pushing loose earth up a pile like a platform under the up pipe. Uh, and suddenly, far above their heads, they heard something. It was a thumping, a, a, a noise of something heavy coming d- down bump, uh, um, right over where they were, where, where they were. And they both went tense. Harry said, "It's a human! Let's go!" George said, "Wait!" They crouched around the earth pile. The thumping went on. It, it wasn't uh, regular. And there was a thump, a pause, another thump. Nothing else happened at first. It's walking. When it stops, we'll go up, uh, crackled George. And he, w- and he would have too. Only suddenly there was another noise. It was a swish, a pattering like rain on the surface. And then a great gurgle, a whoosh. Uh, and before they could think what to do, something came plummeting down towards them. Anyways, guys, this will be the end of the video. I really hope you liked the little voice changer clip at the beginning. And... Yeah, like sh- like uh, this video, share it, subscribe with the bell on, f- and follow me on my Insta at bookworm underscore d- WOS, all letters are lowercase. And in my next video, I'll be doing a little something other with the voice changer. I really hope you liked this video, and the if you didn't see the part one of like, um, you know, I also did Harry the Poisonous Centipede part one. If you didn't see that, I'll leave a link down in the uh, description. Actually, I won't. Anyways, and guys, so the reason I won't is because, well... If you, like, go into my channel, like, you'll anyway see the part one. And you'd want to see the part one, like, before part two, right? Anyone would. So, anyways, guys, bye. And, and, okay, what am I saying? Anyways, guys, bye.